Hello to everybody. My name is Heike Walz and um, I'm from the Augustana Hochschule Neuendelzau and also a member of the VIPT um, and based in Bavaria, or to be precise, in Franconia. And, and we have a wonderful panel now. It's a German South African dialogue, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you the first speaker, Professor Trauger Dienichen. He is Professor for Christian Theory of the Society at Bochum University. And this is more or less social ethics, is his theme. And he's not only a Protestant theologian, but also an economist. And he published a wide range uh, books about social Protestantism, the history of social ideas in Germany, Protestant roots of the social market principle in Germany, but also about economic ethics and the diaconie and Catholic characters. So we have an expert on this crossroad between economics and social ethics, and he's also based in the Ruhrgebiet, which is an um, industrial area where these questions about political and especially economic globalization are really, um, really um, going around. <laughs> and now um, he will give us um, a bilingual speech. His PowerPoint will be in English and his talk in German. So <laughs> we will have the opportunity to, to listen to you, Professor Trauger Dierchen. I want to uh, ask you to come to the floor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's just to save uh, time. Uh, okay, ich gehe in vier Schritten vor. Ich werde ganz kurz was zur Globalisierung sagen, ihre Konsequenzen darstellen und dann fragen, was uh, Public Theology in diesem Kontext bedeuten kann. Der Begriff der Globalisierung hat eine semantische Karriere hinter sich seit den späten 1990er Jahren. Ähm, nichtsdestotrotz, bis in die Gegenwart ist es äh, eine eher unpräzise und nicht klar umrissene Vorstellung. Deshalb ist es für mich hilfreich, eine historische Perspektive einzunehmen. In historischer Perspektive kann man eine erste Globalisierung, die Zeit des Kolonialismus und des klassischen Imperialismus, unterscheiden von der zweiten Globalisierung seit den 1980er, 90er Jahren. Der Unterschied, ganz kurz, ging es im klassischen Kolonialismus im Wesentlichen um den Kampf, Wettbewerb um Einflusszonen, um Rohstoffzugänge und so weiter, haben wir jetzt einen intensiven Wettbewerb zwischen äh, Produktionsstandorten, einen intensiven Wettbewerb um sozusagen ja, ökonomische ähm, Effizienz in unterschiedlichen Weltreligionen. Diese Globalisierung seit den 1980er, 90er Jahren hat verschiedene Rahmenbedingungen, es gibt das politische Konzept der neoliberalen Deregulierung, die ganz wesentlich dazu beigetragen hat. Daneben aber genauso bestimmte ähm, technische Voraussetzungen wie die Informations- und Kommunikationstechnologien oder neue Formen der Logistik und anderes. Ich habe hier einige Definitionen Ihnen an die Wand geworfen, ohne auf Sie im Einzelnen einzugehen. Ich denke, es ist grundlegend wichtig, zwischen Neoliberalismus und Globalisierung zu unterscheiden, historisch kennen wir sie seit den 1990er Jahren nur in einem engen Konnex. Systematisch gibt es allerdings Differenzierungen. Gegebenenfalls können wir darüber noch diskutieren, aber um das sozusagen festzuhalten, dass es nicht von vornherein nur auf eine politische Ausrichtung festgeschrieben wird. Was sind nun die Konsequenzen der Globalisierung? Zunächst in systematischer Hinsicht, das erscheint mir sehr wichtig zu sein, verändert die Globalisierung das Raum- und Zeitwahrnehmen. Räume verlieren schlichtweg an Bedeutung und alle gesellschaftlichen Akteure, die auf Räume konzentriert oder basiert sind, wie das Rechtssystem, der Nationalstaat, ich denke in vielerlei Hinsicht auch die Kirchen und die Religion, 
verlieren an Handlungskompetenz, all diejenigen, für die Räume tendenziell vernachlässigbar sind und die sehr schnell mit Zeit umgehen können und müssen, wie das ökonomische System oder auch das Wissenschaftssystem, gewinnen an Handlungsmacht und an Bedeutung. Ökonomische und soziale Konsequenzen der Globalisierung sind das, was am meisten diskutiert werden. Es gibt weltweit gesehen durchaus beachtliche Wohlfahrtsgewinne durch die Globalisierung, nicht zuletzt auch die absolute Armut ist zurückgedrängt worden, nicht nur wegen der Globalisierung, sondern auch wegen der Millenniumsziele und so weiter. Aber nichtsdestotrotz haben wir sowohl absolut wie auch in Prozentzahlen dort einen erfreulichen Rückgang. Was die Kehrseite ist, überall in den nationalen Gesellschaften wie auch weltweit wächst die Ungleichheit, zum Teil dramatisch. Man kann das mit Hilfe bestimmter statistischer, soziologischer Messdaten, Gini-Koeffizient und so weiter relativ genau nachhalten. Und ähm, dieses weitere oder weitgehende Anwachsen der Ungleichheit ist eine der sozusagen größten Herausforderungen der Globalisierung und dann natürlich die problematischen ökologischen Folgen, die damit verknüpft sind. Ja, ähm, hier einfach mal ein Schaubild, was sozusagen die Dominanz des globalen Nordens zeigt. Wir haben hier eine aggregierte Darstellung von Börsenwerten, von Handelsfinanzströmen, auch von Flugrouten und Touristen. Und Sie sehen sozusagen, wie das, was man klassisch die Triade nennt, eine absolute Dominanz im Blick auf den Welthandel, den Weltverkehr ausübt und wie relativ dünn äh, die Ausrichtungen in den Süden sind. Eine noch andere Tabelle macht das noch einmal deutlicher. Wir haben hier Weltprojektionen, die die Größe des Landes in Relation zur Wirtschaftskraft darstellen, oben von 2003 und dann eine Prognoseprojektion von 2030. Auch da wieder die ganz klare Dominanz des Nordens gegenüber dem Süden. Nordamerika wird eher stabil bleiben, Europa vielleicht stagnieren, wenn man die Zahlen vergleicht und Ost- und Südasien eher eine weitere Entwicklung nehmen. Das Problem ist, dass wenn nicht etwas Dramatisches geschieht, der Süden, vor allem Südamerika und Afrika, eher noch mehr abgehängt werden, als das gegenwärtig schon der Fall ist. Und wenn man jetzt eine Welttafel hätte, die die demografische Entwicklung zeigt, sehen wir, dass das genau umgekehrt ist und äh, über die Konsequenzen, die sich aus diesen beiden Bildern dann ergeben, brauche ich, glaube ich, in diesem Raum nicht viel zu sprechen. Das liegt sozusagen auf der Hand. Neben den genannten ökonomischen, sozialen gibt es, glaube ich, auch grundlegende soziokulturelle Konsequenzen der Globalisierung, die ich zumindest ganz kurz ansprechen möchte. Denn getrieben wird die Globalisierung wesentlich durch internationale Finanzmärkte und deren Verwertungslogik. Das ist jetzt nicht nur ein ökonomisches, sondern ich glaube auch ein ganz stark sozialkulturelles Problem. Denn dadurch, dass dies passiert, werden sozusagen ja, geldbasierte Interaktionen, Verrechenbarkeit, Objektivierbarkeit zu dem kulturellen Maßstab, nach dem unsere Wahrnehmungen und nach dem auch unsere Verhaltensmuster erfolgen. Die scheinbare Eindeutigkeit von Zahlen, von Geldströmen ähm, sind eben nicht nur ein ökonomischer Fakt, sondern sind auch etwas, was kulturelle Wahrnehmungen prägen, indem sie immer dominanter werden in der medialen Kommunikation und auch weit darüber hinaus. Das ganz kurz als Vogelperspektive, ein paar Stichworte zu dem, was man zur Globalisierung in der Kürze der Zeit sagen kann. Eine ganz kurze sozialphilosophische Zwischenbetrachtung, bevor ich dann zu den eigentlichen Herausforderungen von Public Theology eingehe. Der Westen, wenn man es mal so ganz global sagt, ist natürlich stolz auf das, was Habermas etwa einen egalitären Universalismus nennt. Der ist in sich ambivalent, weil einerseits dieser egalitäre Universalismus natürlich auch so etwas wie der Masterplan des Kolonialzeitalters und der Missionsstrategien waren und auch wer heute den Freihandel verteidigt, hat in der Regel universalistische Prinzipien. Auf der anderen Seite, sagt Habermas, ist aber gerade auch der Universalismus in dem Sinn ein Anknüpfungspunkt für Kritik an problematischen ökonomischen und sozialen Konsequenzen. Allerdings ist das die Selbstwahrnehmung des Westens in ihrer Ambivalenz, wie sie Habermas sehr schön herausstellt, aber in der Fremdwahrnehmung sieht das nochmal anders aus, da wird, ich denke, mit einem gewissen Recht im Westen eben vorgeworfen, dass dieser Universalismus letztlich dann doch nicht eine gemeinsam geteilte Lebenswelt meint, sondern dass der Westen Europa sehr stark selbstreferenziell ist und durch bestimmte Konstruktionen von 
Rasse, Gender und viel mehr Differenzen einzieht, die dann den eigenen universalistischen Anspruch sozusagen hinterfragen. Das ist einfach nur ein Merkposten, ähm, den man dann in auch, denke ich, theologisch-sozialethische Debatten mit aufnehmen könnte und sollte. Hintergrund dessen, was Public Theology aus meiner Sicht ist, ist durchaus die Rolle der Kirchen. Die Kirchen sind ein entscheidender Agent in der entstehenden, wachsenden Zivilgesellschaft, ähm, wobei insbesondere die liberalen Mainstream-Kirchen ähm, weltweit sozusagen sich vor allem mit den sozialen und ökologischen Konsequenzen der Globalisierung auseinandersetzen und ähm, versuchen, ja, ich sag mal, die universalen, inklusiven Zusagen der biblischen Tradition ähm, stark zu machen. Dahinter steht ähm, auch die Idee, dass Religion über Inklusionsmechanismen verfügt, die andere gesellschaftliche Subsysteme in der Form nicht haben. Religion kann und tut dies weltweit gesehen auch viel leichter und besser Menschen integrieren als etwa das ökonomische System oder das Rechtssystem, was sehr voraussetzungsreiche Bedingungen ähm, an die Einzelnen stellt, um teilzunehmen. Im Religionssystem kann man relativ leicht teilnehmen, man muss irgendwie überzeugt sein, beten oder was auch immer und das ist ein Inklusionsmechanismus, der in Berlin eher schlecht, aber weltweit immer noch ganz hervorragend ähm, zu funktionieren scheint. Ähm, und von daher kommt sozusagen den damit äh, integrierten inklusiven Strategien, ähm, die auch nicht zuletzt äh, in der theologisch-biblischen Tradition verwurzelt sind, glaube ich, eine ganz hohe und zentrale Bedeutung zu. Was kann jetzt Public Theology, wobei ich im strengen Sinn eigentlich nur von Public Christian Theology reden würde. Man müsste das im Blick auf die Pluralität noch mal differenzieren, aber ich beziehe mich jetzt hier stark auf die christliche Perspektive. Was kann sie nun in eine entstehende Weltzivilgesellschaft, ähm, jetzt gab es ja diesen äh, Civil 20 2017 Gipfel, ich glaube, Sie werden das auch gleich noch ansprechen, ähm, in Hamburg, wo äh, sozusagen ähm, ein Stück weit dies auch greifbar wird. Was können da äh, Public Theology Konzepte einbringen. Ich denke, der erste Punkt, ähm, es ist schlichtweg eine Kritik der Dominanz dieses berechenbaren, geldbasierten Interaktionssystems, was wir ähm, sozusagen inzwischen durch die Dominanz der Finanzmärkte mehr oder minder akzeptieren und damit ist, glaube ich, in neuer Weise auch die Gottesfrage schlichtweg gestellt. Wenn man mit Bultmann Gott als die alles bestimmende Wirklichkeit bestimmt, ist eben die Frage, ob Gott oder Geld, Falk Wagner hat das mal sehr schön auch entwickelt, die alles bestimmende Wirklichkeit sind oder nicht. Das ist, glaube ich, eine theologische Frage, die wir offen halten und gerade durch die Globalisierung uns immer wieder neu stellen müssen. Daneben kann und Sollen die Religionen alternative Wahrnehmungen des Menschseins gerade durch ihre Symbolkraft öffentlich ausdrücken können? Also der Umgang mit Leid etwa ist etwas, was die dominierenden Akteure der Globalisierung schlichtweg verdrängen oder ausschließen. Religion hat durch ihr Symbolsystem, ich denke alle Religionen an dem Punkt, eine Möglichkeit verdrängte und weithin in den Hintergrund gestellte Dimension des menschlichen Lebens zu benennen. Und nicht zuletzt dann als christliche Theologie biblische Bilder von Gerechtigkeit, Solidarität und so weiter entwickeln ein Konzept des guten Lebens, das haben wir ja schon ansatzweise angesprochen, wie das dann auch mit dem Gerechten zu verknüpfen ist, aber ich denke, diese Voraussetzung zu wissen, was gutes Leben ist, ist ganz basal, um dann eine aktive Rolle in der Zivilgesellschaft zu spielen. Ganz kurz ein Ausblick im Blick auf die Ekklesiologie. Ich glaube, wir erleben gegenwärtig eine neue Aufspaltung, vor allem des Protestantismus, aber vielleicht sogar der Weltchristenheit zwischen den liberalen und den neopentekostalen, charismatischen, zum Teil auch indigenen Kirchen. Ich denke, was wir brauchen, ist eine neue Würdigung, auch dieser neopentekostal charismatischen Traditionen. Sie integrieren zum Teil gesellschaftlich aufstrebende Schichten, vor allem in Südamerika, vor allem aber auch stark marginalisierte Gruppen, etwa in Afrika. Und ich sage mal selbst, so etwas wie das Gospel of Wells äh, ist etwas, was man theologisch herausfordern und ernst nehmen muss, weil dort in möglicherweise verzerrter Form, aber das ist jetzt schon eine problematische Wertung, Dinge, die mit gutem Leben einfach zu tun haben, eine Rolle spielen und ausgedrückt werden. Und da Wege des Dialogs und der Kommunikation zu finden, halte ich für eine ganz zentrale ökumenische, ekklesiologische Herausforderung. Und ich glaube, die Sozialethik und damit auch die Public Theology kann eine ganz wichtige Brücke an diesem Punkt bilden, weil über Konzepte gemeinsamen guten Lebens, was soziale, ökonomische Angelegenheiten angeht, kann man sich 
leichter einigen als über vieles andere. Zumindest wäre das eine deutsche ökumenische Erfahrung aus den letzten ungefähr 110, 20 Jahren. Ja, damit bin ich schon zum Schluss gekommen und bei der letzten sozusagen Tafel. Was kann Public Theology jetzt im Blick auf die sogenannte zweite Globalisierung tun? Zunächst ähm, die Kirchen verfügen über ein weltweites, fast einzigartiges Netzwerk, um eine alternative Globalisierung sozusagen ähm, realisieren zu können und damit ein alternatives Netzwerk des Handels, der Informationsgewinnung zu entwickeln. Man kann dann auf dieser Grundlage alternative, humane Formen der Globalisierung entwickeln, die nicht zuletzt eine Restitution des Politischen anstreben. Und es geht um eine wieder neue Einbettung der Ökonomie in Lebensweltbezüge, vor allem in politische Bezüge, die durch die reale neoliberale Politik weitgehend verloren gegangen sind. Dann kann und muss Public Theology sozialethische Kriterien entwickeln, um vor allem die institutionellen Defizite, die sowohl das weltweite Handelssystem wie auch einzelne Ökonomien im Norden wie im Süden, ich habe das Stichwort Korruption einfach da nur mal hingeschrieben, aber vor allem eben auch institutionelle Defizite weltweit, die noch dramatischer sind, dann ja ein Stück weit wieder bekämpfen oder korrigieren zu können. Und schließlich und letztlich ist man einfach ein wichtiger Dialogfaktor, nicht zuletzt mit den treibenden Kräften der Globalisierung, mit Finanzinvestoren oder auch mit ökonomischen Akteuren, Unternehmen. Und ähm, es gibt sehr viele gute Beispiele, die ich im Einzelnen nennen könnte, die zeigen, wie eine bestimmte Kritik, manchmal auch Skandalisierung von Handlungsformen, durchaus dann dazu beitragen kann, dass auch diese Akteure lernen, sich ändern, so etwas wie Unternehmenskodizes entwickeln und äh, dadurch dann auch sozusagen als Akteure auf der mittleren Ebene ihren Beitrag leisten, um die Globalisierung schlichtweg humaner zu gestalten. Und das wäre, denke ich, der entscheidende Zielpunkt. Das war's. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Thank you very much, Professor Jenichen. You did a very good job to keep the time. I must admit, I myself, I'm not so good in keeping the time. I'm Latin Americanized, but I will do my best now. And um, I have the pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Diane Forster the director of uh, the Bias Nodé Center for Public Theology. And as you all know, South Africa and especially Stellenbosch University has a big tradition in public theology. And he also teaches systematic theology, ethics and public theology there. And I um, read the blog he is writing almost every day, I think. And um, there I learned that uh, Only recently he completed two large research projects. The first one uh, is about Nelson Mandela and political theologies in South Africa. And the second one is his second PhD, very interesting topic also, uh, the impossibility or possibility <laughs> for or of forgiveness, question mark. And there he has been looking at uh, the question how black and white Christians conceptualized forgiveness in contemporary South Africa. And also this topic with respect to the significant economic, social, political and racial divides. And I think this is uh, the question now also. And I want to give you just one insight because um, Diane told us that he has a flock. If you don't know what is a flock, I, I didn't either. It's uh, a mixture between a blog and a video. And so you can go to uh, the internet and uh, watch videos, sm uh, small vi short videos. And last night I watched the last one. It's about, the title is Berlin, more red than green, question mark, environmental stewardship, ecology, politics and economics. So if you wonder, <laughs> you, you can go to, to the internet. Now we, uh, uh, we are very happy that you, that to have you here and to listen your in, to your insights about public theology. Thank you, Diane.
Right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, in the interests of time, I'm also going to speak English. How does that sound? <laughs> I'd first have to learn German before I could speak it. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, just quickly to say, I'm, I'm going to cover three basic things. Uh, I often start my lectures in this way, so that uh, if persons want a nap, they're welcome to take it. I really want to talk, uh, firstly, just about the global prominence of the religious uh, in society as a form of globalization. The second thing that I want to do, and it was very interesting just to listen to the previous speaker, is I want to talk uh, about a phenomenon which I think is a third globalization, which has to do with the democratization of uh, global identities. Um, and then the third thing that I want to do is... Uh, perhaps make a case for what uh, public theologies and public theologians might contribute uh, in this context. So last week I had the privilege of participating in the G20 Interfaith uh, Summit here in Potsdam in Berlin and my experience has influenced the approach to my topic today. I listened to speakers and participated in panels and it was interesting to see the relationship between normative ethical approaches to economics and politics and descriptive analytical engagements with these subjects. One aspect that struck me again and again during these meetings was the general recognition of the global prominence and indeed importance of religion and the religious in relation to economic and political systems globally. Not only the prevalence of religious belief, but also the impact that religion has on global politics and economics. And this was a significant theme in many of the presentations and uh, uh, conversations that I could participate in, and so I'd like to deconstruct that um, a little bit. So Pew Research findings, uh, the most recent findings, uh, the, the author of, of this research, uh, I think his name is Brian Grimm, was actually present at the meetings, um, suggest that 84% of the global population uh, self-identify some form of religious belief. Now, this means that uh, religions and religious belief in their varied and different forms may in fact be one of the global phenomena that most human beings share. Or, in a certain sense, something that may bind us to one another. Indeed, Globalization, as we've heard, is not one single thing, it's many different things, and the same could be said for religions and the religious, even for theologies in their varied forms. And of course we know that religion is not one thing, but there are some points of intersection between notions of belief and the consequences of beliefs in the lives of persons and the ways in which these give expression to complex social and theological identities and of course also how those identities shape uh, structures. Now, in this regard, I tend to adopt a Hawassian perspective that religion and theology are not ontologically different. The separation is a construct, a necessary theological, uh, theoretical delineation for concept clarification, but in the lives of most religious persons, there is actually no separation between religion and theology. The two mutually intersect. Religious beliefs, religious communities as actualizations of beliefs are a complex interaction of theological conviction and social identity. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that I will do is think about this from the perspective of being an African and a global citizen. You see, my own social identity is already complicated. I find Charles Taylor's critique of the traditional displacement theory of secularization discourse as a helpful resource in this regard. And it does show me that what we call the religious is varied as the notion of the global itself. Now, to return to the statistics previously cited, one always needs to take statistics, particularly these ones, with a grain of salt. I don't remember, by the way, participating in that survey. Moreover, as we know, uh, the wide scope of religions and religious uh, traditions, as we have noted, does not mean that people have a great deal in common. However, the research suggests that 31.5% of this group indicate that they are Christian, the largest grouping uh, amongst the global religious. 23.2% identify as Muslim, 
15% as Hindu, 16.3% as unaffiliated, and the remainder are supposedly persons who hold no faith perspective. Now, these confessional and religious groupings do have some measure of internal coherence, and it cannot be denied that they foster a measure of shared social identity, even if there are doctrinal differences. Regardless of the valid objections, even if this statistic is only partially correct, in spite of the wide variety of what can be classified as religion and religious, there are at least some plausible consequences for faith and public life globally. So that's the first point that I want to make. We live in a world in which religion and the religious features prominently, uh, whether we see or acknowledge that or not. The second point that I want to make relates to the democratization of globalization. Now, the impact of religion on society is not a new phenomenon. Uh, I think many of us uh, can cite many examples of this. But from an African and indeed a majority world perspective, I can concur that the place, voice, role and our space around the theological table has changed and is changing within the world. Theology, religion, and indeed the voice of the two-thirds world religious is finding a place in the global conversation on religion, politics, and economics. The proliferation of information technologies, global news media, global trade, global politics, are facilitating an increasing awareness that in spite of our, and I quote, radical differences and diverse contexts, we form part of one world which we all share, according to Dirk Smith, end of quote. So let's consider just one aspect of how uh, this works. Um, I'm sure all of us would remember the shaky cell phone uh, video recordings from Tahir Square in Egypt in 2011, or in 2010, uh, the global uproar that resulted when the Florida extremist Christian pastor Terry Jones threatened to burn a copy of the Quran. Indeed, uh, with the election of Donald Trump, uh, the exit of uh, Britain from uh, Europe, we've seen that global citizens are finding ways to participate and even shape global conversations without needing the permission of power brokers or uh, professionals. In South Africa, we certainly saw this, and two of my colleagues are here, with the roads must fall and fees must fall movements. These movements were predominantly organized around ideas rather than persons. And the cohesive factor that brought people together was a commitment to something that was more than just uh, one particular leader. So unlike the Nelson Mandela or Desmond Tutu of the pre-1994 period, now people were united uh, in some ways around ideas. The work of the uh, Spanish sociologist Manuel Castells has particularly helped me to understand uh, this phenomenon, particularly his uh, book Social uh, uh, Networks of Outrage, Social Movements uh, in an Internet Age. Um, Florian Herner's uh, wonderful chapter in the, uh, in the new book, which was published by the Berlin Institute for Public Theology, uh, also deals with this particular subject in a very, very wonderful way. And I would encourage you uh, to read that chapter. I have just one quote from it. He says, media such as newspapers, TV programs, blogs, or social internet platforms are of political relevance because they mediate political discourses and constitute publics in which public opinion is formed and transformed and injustice is criticized. So this is my second contention, and uh, I have one more point, Heike, then I'm finished. Um, the second contention is that we are experiencing a new form of democratized globalization in a, uh, a global, uh, global religious social imaginary. So what might the role of public theologians uh, be in this regard, particularly in relation to the issues of politics and economics? Um, 
The one thing that I, that I have found um, about many of these discussions, and I'm sure all of us, uh, Torsten made particular reference to this last night, who are on social media, recognize that social media are very vocal, but often radically misinformed. Uh, Facebook, for example, has an algorithm that will deliberately connect you with people who think like you think. And eventually you all begin to think that the world thinks in the same way. Twitter is much better, by the way. Uh, it's less aggregated. And I think that in this kind of global world where people hold beliefs and the beliefs have public consequences and they're expressing them on platforms without the need of moderation or permission, the role of the public theologian is to remain a critical discourse partner. And here I see particularly my role as a public theologian to be first and foremost the work of a theologian. Uh, as Marcia Pelli reminded us yesterday to remain connected uh, to the traditions from which I come, uh, to be able to give some kind of understanding, to remind uh, and invite people to re-engage uh, the notions from which they are drawing strength uh, and insight, but also to allow the voices of those who are reforming or transforming the traditions that I hold uh, to bring new perspectives to my work. So in conclusion, let me say, I think that we're in a phase, a third phase of globalization. And I think it's a lot less dependent on uh, dominant political and economic actors I think that we are seeing those who were previously excluded or disregarded finding a place at the table. But not all of that is positive. And that means that we do need critical, carefully constructed public theologies. Thank you. First of all, I would like to start with uh, your notions about globalization because um, my impression was that uh, there were two approaches. First of all, the, the economic and the social cultural approach and also the philosophical approach to globalization and then Dion with a sort of religious um, globalization. And the question would be um, if there is any tension between uh, your um, approaches. And adding to this, I would like to ask maybe a question you don't like, but would you agree, especially Diane, uh, that globaliz globalization and the ideology of neoliberalism should be separated? I don't know who wants to. Um, let me first say I'm a dilettante in this area, so uh, I'm just going to say things that I think. I hope that's okay. Um, I tell you what, uh, uh, let, let me answer your question by uh, giving you a problem. When, when I read the, the topic, um, public theologies, uh, politics and economics, um, one of my first responses to that topic in relation to globalization was to problematize the notion that even that topic is a westernized concept. I mean, in Africa, I don't know, you may know the statistics, but I think it's up to 80% of the African populace uh, function outside of the formal economies, so outside of the banking sector uh, and these formal economic structures. But it doesn't mean that they are not part of an economy or economies. So, uh, in some senses, my approach to the notion of globalization says that if all we are looking at are articulated, regulated, uh, identifiable, particularly from a Western uh, knowledge perspective, structures such as policies, trade uh, agreements, uh, international bodies, then we are disregarding 
a, a very, very significant part of the two-thirds world, the majority world. Um, and these people are connecting with global consciousness, shaping it, uh, consuming media, producing uh, content, uh, developing identities in relation to who they are, identities of aspiration in means which are not easily mediated through these uh, social structures. And I think we, we're part of the tension, I think, that we're seeing uh, in societies like here in Germany where migration is becoming such a significant point is that persons who are entering into these uh, formalized views of uh, global structures disregard them. You know, they're not entirely their frame of reference. So that doesn't answer your question. Okay, you are right. There's a huge informal sector of uh, working structures in the South, and um, my statistics I gave about uh, the world map do not uh, integrate and express uh, this reality. Um, but nevertheless, um, okay, what I wanted to show is a Western perspective, but um, the majority of the people in the South um, they were addicted to this perspective because they want to come to Europe, to the US. Um, they want to be integrated in the formal sector of working, of economies and so on. And um, so we are challenging the problem. Um, we have a globalization of mass media, of social media and so on. All people are knowing uh, a lot about the world. but. We have no uh, possibility to integrate them in our formal political and economical structures. And this uh, we have to do, we have to uh, bring um, a formal sector of uh, living from your own work and so on to the countries of the South. Uh, there's no alternative to this. And uh, so um, I'm a skeptic about uh, um, the development of the globalization. It is determined by uh, powerful agents in the north, uh, in the tri triad, and um, this is in tension with uh, all people that are connected by mass media with the one world, and I do not know any solution of this tension. And uh, it's dominated by neoliberalism politics um, until today. Maybe Trump will change it, but he will change it in a way that will not work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you give me one, uh, one idea that there is no alternative, you were saying, but in fact both of you were giving us some insights about alternatives uh, to our counter-narratives and counter-movements. So maybe the first question would be, what are the, um, uh, the social movements after Nelson Mandela and uh, Desmond Tutu you were talking about. I was very keen on that. Uh, if you could give us a little bit more insight. And maybe I, I will say the next question also. You, you uh, Professor Jenichen, uh, told us about um, the common life or the common good as a sort of connecting point between neo-Pentecostal, charismatic and mainstream churches. So that would be also a point of discussion if you would agree about that or, yeah. Um, so South Africa currently, I'll speak just about the South African context, is in, in a very, very uh, interesting and complex uh, space. Um, 23 years after the end of political apartheid, and I, I always make this statement, I encourage people not to use the phrase post-apartheid South Africa. Uh, it's disingenuous. Uh, apartheid hasn't ended in South Africa, politically perhaps, but uh, the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation shows that we are now more economically unequal in South Africa, that poverty has increased for the majority of citizens that uh, white South Africans are wealthier than they have ever been. And the use of that phrase simply compounds uh, the suffering and daily struggle of those who face the slow violence of social and economic uh, injustice. So after the end of political uh, apartheid, entering into this new uh, democratic uh, phase in South Africa, um, there's been a, a disillusionment, in a sense, with some of the narratives 
that were constructed, even around persons like Nelson Mandela, uh, Desmond Tutu, the Rainbow Nation, uh, and particularly so with what we call the born free generation. So young people who were born after 1994 into freedom, but still find themselves living in terrible conditions, sometimes even worse than their parents lived under apartheid. And I can say that in those uh, conditions, there is tremendous distrust uh, for individuals and institutions that hold power. We're seeing what I think David Corton would call a fourth generation people's movement emerging. Uh, the roads must fall and fees must fall. We're responses in that regard um, because uh, policy, economic theory, uh, the pressures of global trade, corruption, all of these things act upon the populace. Um, people are taking matters into their own hands. And I think that there are alternatives, whether they are good alternatives or not, sustainable alternatives is the question. Um, we've seen, for example, in the educational sector that uh, in 2015 and last year to an extent, uh, almost all of South Africa's universities were shut down completely by students who were saying the economic system that operates within universities is not sustainable and we're not willing to continue with it. So I think that, that what we are seeing is that, that people are struggling to find alternatives. One of the roles I think that we have is in South Africa, which is very different from Germany, there is tremendous trust in the religious sector. 85% uh, of South Africans self-identify as Christians. Uh, the last, last uh, World Values survey showed that 74% of South Africans said that uh, religious leaders and religious institutions are the highest form of trust they have in society. But we are not utilizing that well. Um, we, we're not capitalizing on that opportunity to work for alternative narratives, alternative strategies uh, that operate for the common good. There's a gap uh, between the liberal churches and the new, new uh, Pentecostal or charismatic churches. And my point is uh, to say that social ethics, um, the reflection of biblical traditions about solidarity, justice, and so on, may be a bridge over this gap. Um, uh, there is an experience from Germany uh, about 120 years ago um, the first uh, ecumenical co-confessional um, organization in Germany between Catholics and Protestants were the so-called Christian trade unions. They were founded in the Ruhrgebiet, in my area, <laughs> so I know it a little bit. And um, uh, a lot of priests, um, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church and even uh, Protestant uh, church leaders, they were criticizing and fighting against this initiative from uh, from the people, from miners, work, work, uh, workers, and so on. But uh, it is an example that shows uh, that social interests may dominate different views of the world in religious or uh, philosophical perspective. And um, my idea is that uh, common social interests of people in the South and maybe in the North may um, help to develop a bridge over this new division um, of world Christianity and um, public theology related to social ethics problems uh, may play an important role to build this bridge. That was uh, my point. Very good. I, I was thinking the third question would have been, if we had time, if this is also a bridge for the interreligious uh, public theology. Uh, maybe we come back later to that, but I saw already five questions and I think we have to go public now. The first question was uh, from, I don't know your name? Uh, Jonas Petrotsrum, thanks. Um, the, I want to ask, uh, maybe especially Dion, uh, about, you, you said the sentence, um, my social identity is very complex. Um, I, th I, I want to ask about, basically, we're, we're, part of, we're part of the story that, is, uh, that was presented uh, both by Professor Jenichen and by, by Dion. Um, and I, I think it, we in Germany can sometimes ease, a little too easily forget that we're actually part of the, part of the whole um, uh, story as well. Um, so we basically all sit here because people do business and they pay taxes or they donate or they pay a church tax or something. 
Um, so really, really we're in, in this room and can critique or talk about this because of the system that is in place. So I'm, I'm kind of asking, um, what can we do to, well, what's our role in this? And how do we, I mean, specifically we in this room, how do we take on responsibility in, in the scheme that was just sketched? Thank you, and we will take up the second question, and maybe the third one, and then have a round. Yes. Yeah, thank you. My question is uh, for both, maybe more for the second speaker, is about the outcome of globalization <laughs> in terms of theology. When it comes to economy, uh, we will see uh, and we are sure that the European Europe and Central European countries, the US, are the winner worldwide. P everyone is eating McDonald's and uh, uh, buying uh, German cars and so on and so forth. But when it comes to theology, I think theologians should think about that. European the theologians will be the losers. Honestly, uh, also Muslims, Muslim theologians in Europe will be the losers because the values that we share in Europe, European values like human rights, homosexuality, and all these, this debate that the Christian church had uh, in Europe, uh, my colleagues from the, uh, the, of all over the world, they don't see, they don't identify themselves with the European values of the, the, church, the, the church and of the mosque and all this. And if there is a globalization, we speak, uh, we go global, we will be the losers because either we will think that we will propagate our values, so we're back to colonialism, European colonialism, and we will try to, to see the world think of the same way, or we stick to the global uh, issue and we will be, we will lose all that and come to the debate that we go back to uh, uh, backwards to old values of the religion. So I think the outcome, and I'm, I don't find any solution now, because we have to think about that. Uh, religion have been always something local, something contextual, and it can be uh, something global. I can share gl global uh, uh, ethics with uh, uh, people also. Although I respect them and I see them as the same people, but I can't think the same way. And the third question was ah, Dietrich. Dietrich Werner. Just a short uh, remark and also a question on the notion of democratization of globalization, as both of you have pointed to the relevance of social movements and also of religious community as acting in civil, as civil society actors. Uh, just to share one experience from our organization, Bread for the World, National Protestant Development Services, and we operate in, in, with partner organizations in more than 90 countries and more than 1,200 projects uh, per year. One message which comes up very strongly is just uh, the country that is that in many of our partner countries we face uh, shrinking space of civil society. And that is confirmed also by data which comes from an instrument, probably you are familiar with Civicus Monitor, which has argued in a recent um, kind of uh, presentation and major report that out of 104 countries monitored globally in terms of the space for civil society activities, only nine uh, present full uh, capacities for civil society organizations to operate, whereas all the other countries suffer from either mild or strong or very severe restrictions of civil society. So while we need more social movement, more activities of civil society actors like religious community, we actually face as a kind of um, a movement alongside the tightened uh, process of neoliberal globalization a heavily shrinking space of society. And I would argue or ask, isn't it a task of public theology and a global <coughs> network of public theology and the Berlin Institute of Public Theology, first of all, to raise the issue of where the public is constituted, is defended, is safeguarded, so that civil society actors can actually articulate themselves. Because we face so severe um, discriminations of our partner organizations, may this be in India, in Malaysia, in some African countries, uh, I will not name uh, all of them, but that is a core issue which I think ought to be 
on our agenda uh, to argue in this direction. Thank you very much. I think we will go back to the panel and um, maybe who will start to respond to one of the questions. Okay, I'll start with the last question. Um, uh, it's well known um, uh, that it's a key question of economic success and political um, stability um, uh, to have uh, institutional conditions uh, that are close connected to democracy and uh, to having a space for civil society. And um, I think uh, the concept of civil society we are knowing from Europe, from Germany, um, is not to be globalized. Um, in the South, we have other concepts of civil society and there, uh, churches and religions too are playing a core role because they are the movements, the social movements. If you have no social movements in a strange sense, like uh, trade unions and so on, uh, then religious organizations, churches, they have indeed the role of being uh, part of the civil society, even if it is not uh, named uh, civil society. And uh, nevertheless, it's necessary to strengthen these uh, uh, initiatives. Perhaps one uh, aspect to you um, about the values of Europe, the old values of other parts of the world. Um, maybe I give you the answer with your own uh, uh, presentation today. Um, you talk about pluralism. I think pluralism is a key concept of the Western world and you mentioned uh, the meaning of pluralism for all parts of the world, for Muslims too, and this is the key idea to globalize. Yeah, um, goodness, I, I don't have a solution uh, or any real constructive answer to give. I think that's a very good starting point. I think. For me, one of, the, one of the, the values, the possibilities of public theology is the dialogical approach. Um, if we are willing to remain in the room with one another, even with those that we disagree with and to continue in dialogue, I think that does bear some fruit sometimes. It, of course, it doesn't always. But I think that's a, a valuable uh, resource in, in public theologies. Um, just to say one other thing about that, one of the things that we're experiencing throughout Africa, but particularly in Southern Africa, is uh, the decolonial turn. So to ask who occupies the center. And uh, I can say that the traditional power relationships uh, will not be sustained. They will not be sustained. They're changing already. Uh, the social imaginary in our context is, is radically different to what it was just 10 years ago, and it's shifting tremendously. Uh, and some of it good and some of it bad. Um, Jonas, maybe just to offer one uh, little uh, bit on, on what you're saying. Uh, for me, part of the way in which I've grappled with your question about social identity and what should we do in this context is to ask the question, uh, who, who is the church? Uh, I think very often I hear people saying the church should... Uh, do this or the church should do that. Now, in South Africa, uh, the church was very involved in the deconstruction of apartheid, as we know, and one of the critiques has been that the, church, the voice of the church is silent, but that's simply not true. Um, I don't know if you know, but the three most powerful individuals in South Africa are all ordained pastors. Jacob Zuma, our president, was ordained by a neo-Pentecostal church. Uh, the minister of, of, of justice is an ordained pastor in a neo-Pentecostal prosperity church. The leader of the opposition is a minister of a prosperity church. So it's not that the voice of the church is silent. Perhaps it's just a very difficult, and I would venture even to say an irresponsible voice, uh, which we are hearing. So I tend to say uh, three things. The first thing is we need to clarify the term, the concept, as Mars here would say. Uh, we need to, to reclaim it. And in South Africa, certainly, church operates on three different levels. Uh, we have the institutional ecumenical church, which is good at engaging policy, often very progressive uh, and can play a role. We have the local congregation that has a responsibility to bear in terms of moral formation, discipleship and care. And then we have our members in a society such as ours. I mean, I'm a, a, a Methodist. 65% of South Africa's parliamentarians are members of my denomination. And look what's going on. So we have a responsibility to also say the church 
is not just a place where we go or a time when we meet. These members of the church are active in society, they're active in the private sector, and we are the ones who are wreaking havoc. Uh, and I think public theology has a role to play there, to begin to question, critique, uh, sometimes even, I think, like Jonas would say, be a little bit prophetic, but maybe 10% prophetic at a time. <laughs> so, can we... Two, two more questions? Oh, the boss is saying no, but we, <laughs> we started late. Okay. Five minutes. Give me five minutes, but if you don't want to ask me this, Do your questions. <laughs> Arm twisted, as I. Um, this is a question um, a, a little bit more to um, Professor Yenkin. Um, when, when I sp spoke yesterday, I ended my talk by saying, and we could discuss the economic policies and praxis that would come out of a relationality as informed by the Christian and Jewish tradition in the discussion. And in the discussion, no one asked about economic policies. So um, I wanted to pass the baton to you and ask, um, what do you see as key or more, most important, most transformative um, economic uh, structures or institutions or policies that would, um, that would emerge from the uh, principles that you discussed, the Christian principles that you discussed? What would you like to, or what do you, uh, what would you like to see? What do you see as emerging from these? What specific economic uh, institutions or changes? Thank you. So, no more question then. I think we need a re embeddedment of economic system in um, uh, politic structures. We need. Um, in Germany, we are talking about the social market system. This is a, a, a form of a frame given by politics, by laws, even by social inventions. And then within this uh, uh, frame, economics may work. And uh, neoliberalism says um, economics is a system of its own. It's uh, um, uh, deconnected from all parts of the living world and we have to reintegrate it, re-embed it by politics. Um, my hope is that the European Union may play a role of a transnational institutional concept of uh, new economics. But this is a hope, no more. Um, I do not know uh, any other alternative. Well, thank you very much. I think the question of a decolonial public theology will be uh, our task to fulfill. But I think uh, now we have to break up and we can maybe talk about it later. I want to thank you so much, for the panelists and also the public, for the inspiring discussion. Thank you.